Welcome to another episode of Psychonaut Sessions, ladies and gentlemen. You're home for all things psycho. This is your host, Daniel Muller. Today we're going to take a look at an underground comic from the comics scene, C-O-M-I-X. They're one of my favorite movements of comics, other than uh, the 80s uh, black and white boom, where the was the underground comics movement of the 60s and 70s where they, you know, normally turned that CS into an X. Um, a lot of wonderful, crazy things came out of that era. A lot of stuff very closely tied to music. So in this case, Brain Fantasy was a, a line of books by Last Gasp, um, who is responsible. They started in 1970, and Last Gasp is responsible for a lot of these really great independent books, um, especially books from like Robert Crumb. Um, they did Weirdo, um, a bunch of other incredible hits that we may take a look at here in the future. Uh, but this particular book was kind of the brainchild of Rick Shubb. So Rick Shubb, if anybody out there who's a musician knows of the Shubb capo, um, he was a musician that started really heavily in the bluegrass movement and also um, did a lot of work with David Grisman, um, many other musicians. Um, and he was an artist as well. Responsible for the Shub capo, like I said, it's a it's a specific ir iridescent capo that a lot of musicians, specifically bluegrass musicians, are familiar with. And um, he was very uh, big in the '60s and '70s in creating a lot of uh, psychedelic art. He did an album for David Grisman. He did a lot of posters for the Carousel venue um, for for incredible acts, including Thelonious Monk. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, B.B. King, Steve Miller Band, so this guy is all over the place. Um, and this is the one comic that he did. Um, so uh, he uh, was approached by George Metzger um, from Last Gasp uh, Comics, introduced him to Ron Turner and Gary, Gary Arlington, the publishers, and they were interested in starting kind of more of a sci-fi fantasy genre um, anthology comic, um, kind of coexisting with Skull, which was their kind of horror-based anthology that we're going to be taking a look at in the near future. I love Skull. And uh, because of his psychedelic art on, on psychedelic posters, they thought he would be the perfect brainchild for, for this book. So... Um, unfortunately, it never lasted past book two. He actually didn't even wasn't even involved in book two, um, just because he didn't anticipate how much work that would just go into creating a comic. <laughs> it's a lot of work, um, and it took a lot of his time. And he had other things going on, and um, just was not able to anticipate the level of effort. But here um, on this cover, you can see that sort of 60s uh, psychedelic poster um, aesthetic um, hard at work. Um, and uh, just I, I can't love it enough. It's called Brain Fantasy Exor Psychic Comics Presents. Brain Fantasy. It's 50 cents. Can you believe it? Um, so, yeah, wonderful start. Let's take a look and see what Rick Shubb has for us. Here we go, 1972. George Metzger, Robert Inwood have a lot of uh, uh, work in this as well. And here we're just getting some kind of cool sci-fi um, oddity piece. So basically these are humans that are in a uh, kind of an alien zoo being looked at. <laughs> Um, and so the first story is called Doomsday. This is um, very much in this kind of um, weird psychedelic style um, of this planet in these aliens called Drooms um, live on this planet and but unfortunately they only have one set of limbs and they're kind of weird monotonous creatures. Uh, they don't do a whole lot. Um, but they live in this landscape that was already 
built by a civilization which preceded them. So we just get kind of this weird, melodic feeling and flow um, of these particular characters and some wonderful artworking scenes, very dreamlike and surrealist landscape. You have this feeling that all this stuff was there and discarded. Um, and there is a priesthood um, of these drooms and their their uh, temples. Um, but it's, again, it's like, it's kind of just taking what they had from before and, and working off of it. Well, one of these drooms found um, an object that had uh, fallen and landed in a remote valley, or so they assumed. And they wheeled it all the way back in the it's a weird foreign object and so of course the priesthood wants to take advantage of that because well this is there's something in there and it's an it's indeed the body of one of the gods so the priests um utilize that of course for worship and power and ra ta 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 and one one morning uh the the being inside this capsule wakes up and of course it's a human their god came to life some really heavy screen tone usage here is really cool wonderful effect and so basically this human is like oh well our theory was correct this planet is capable of supporting human life so you get the sense that he was shot out into space and um was sent to a planet to look for human life or, or place to support human life and doesn't really see a threat by any of these drooms they just they're just kind of there and they're fairly passive um but is pretty enamored by the buildings and how human-like um the buildings are but and he also kind of intimates that his his entourage will be following him soon and then of course he stumbles upon a public library and if you've ever watched Twilight Zone, you probably know where this is going. And he takes a look at some of the books, and apparently, uh, he's he's reading up on human history, and talks about how he was the the in this in this book that he was the first human to be sent off into space to find another planet because Earth was going to shit, right? And unfortunately, right after they sent him off into space, they figured out some sort of uh, teleportation, instantaneous teleportation technology. <laughs> so they didn't need him to find anything anymore. And he was out into space for, you know, generations and generations. And humans had already left the planet at this point. And so the drooms are beings of what was left like mutants um that uh, evolved over time and so he's the only human left and all their technology is gone so apparently he got shot out into space and time warped and he, he kind of like the whole planet of the apes scenario came many 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 years into the future so fun little thing and apparently to be continued into the next I'm going to need to get brain fantasy number two flying saucer man is the next story this is a George Metzger story um, I love this image this image blows my mind this reminds me of an old either Atari no a Coleco vision game with this sort of alien on it, it looks just looks just like this I can't remember the name, but man, it sticks out in my memory. So here we get um, just kind of a rundown, of course, of human history of what we got here in these aliens, uh, these Cyclopean aliens that are, of course, in the skies observing uh, the humans and how mad they are through their history, um, through a war, um, constant war, where all the way back we start at 217 B.C., we go up to 1000 AD, and then March 1954, we get to the nuclear age. And so, you know, they talk about how even observing them, like, taints their thoughts. 
and um, apparently one of them wants to go down and and help change things and they warn him against it of course because they talk about this madness that um, is instilled in the planet um, but he he wants to do something to help um, so he gets into his flying saucer and he goes down and he tries to go out into the streets and basically proselytize to humanity but they ain't listening um and there's also this sort of like empathic telepathic um uh, ability that these particular aliens have so they're getting all of the thoughts and all of the feelings and the emotions of, of human beings um coming at them and it basically drives him mad and he plays some sort of like weird instrument you don't really get to see closely what it is um, but it starts causing the the earth to crack open and break apart and the other aliens come down and say oh the madness got to him we need to save him and so they they take him um, and fly him away because he's infected by the madness of humanity um, but not before the earth completely breaks a lot of fun and then here we get who is this next artist just an incredible <clears throat> I, I don't think it says oh no Inwood so this is this is Roger Inwood um, incredible ink work here for this next story really dark uh, heavy detailed inks just very lifelike love it but here we get some sort of um, scenario where we get a jaguar um, you know hunting a, a few animals um, they go after the animal and then the jaguar gets shot on top of the animal he just attacked by this hunter named Nimrod oh mighty hunter and so this is some sort of future um, that we got here where this character Nimrod appar apparently uh, killed the last jaguar and so there's like the rich elite loves um, to get rare animals and use their furs and um, of course it's this sort of dystopian future as often is in many sci-fi scenarios and so the rich elite is pretty happy um, with having a jaguar coat and because he has basically killed all of the rare species um, and he's responsible for it um, he's going to go try his luck on a new world so he travels to this new world um, across space and arrives and there's hardly anybody around um, so he's going to try to find um, the people and the place is kind of abandoned so he's walking around looking and Unfortunately, they didn't get their page turns um, correct. Um, so anyway, he goes back uh, to his uh, to his ship because he thinks he's going to go radio home. And so it looks like some, somebody may have messed with something on his ship. So he gets his bow ready um, and he goes out to try to hunt for some game. Um, because he's getting hungry so he does find some kind of deer type creatures starts targeting them and of course before he's able to be the jaguar he gets shot and apparently it's these cat like creatures that run the planet and they were hunting him and he of course becomes the skin so pretty fun fun wild story and then here, another Rick Shubb story um, written by David Parker called Where Do We Go From Here? A fun psychedelic script there. Uh, but we get a family who's on their way to some sort of trip. It's really not important. But a mother, father, um, some angry, angsty teenage boy, and their grandmother. And so they're on their way to some sort of uh, weekend getaway, maybe and they get run off of the cliff uh, uh, unfortunately and then their I, not really life flashes before their eyes but all these afterlife scenarios um, start flashing as they are falling um, off the cliff in the car 
and of course the grandmother is going to heaven and that's her experience um, the mother um, has a scenario where she's looking at her own body dead on the cliffs and is um, basically turns invisible and she's going and trying to um, uh, interact with her friends at their like crib game or whatever or their card game and they absolutely can't see her and so she's alone for all eternity the boy um, is in a dark void in his experience and basically is experiencing getting reborn and then the father the father unfortunately he has an experience of complete hell um, where he goes and is on the river sticks look at that look at the water in the way so here we're getting a little bit of Rick Shub, a little bit more of Rick Shubbs kind of fun psychedelic um, wavy forms I just totally dig this stuff um, and gets tossed into the uh, um, infernal pit with the uh, with the uh, Satan devil character here um, and so all of this is apparently just in their minds as they're getting ready to go down and um, crash and then what happens is they come to and what <laughs> what they are is they they basically get incarnated into these um weird uh alien type beings so that's apparently what happens when you die you just you become these like weird <laughs> psychedelic aliens in this weird psychedelic dimension oh they must be the new ones so that's a ton of fun i love this I love that psychedelic art from the 60s and 70s. That is great. And then here we get a, a poem by Tom Stern uh, with art by Rick Shubb. So it's another <clears throat> uh, just kind of fun, drippy, psychedelic um, series of images. I definitely think I'm going to kind of study Rick Shubb a little bit and maybe do some fun riffs for one of my comics um, in the future just tons of fun but it, it's just a little poem about a uh, about a dwarf so we get a floating snail here just epicentropoloidal funnies a mental cycloidal and mental cycloidal diversions <laughs> I love it I definitely recommend um, everyone uh, checking this out and uh you know have a drink or something or a smoke um whenever you dive into these old uh 60s 70s underground comics because there's some great stuff you always got to appreciate the backs of these books because there's usually they usually will either extend out or they'll have their own sort of just a basic you know drawing or painting on the back which is great tons of fun love it that is brain fantasy number one 1972 from last gasp um, from the rick shub of the shub capo so that's it for today ladies and gentlemen and we'll talk to you later keep it psycho